Right, hey folks, so it's part four of the March Q&A. Plenty of good questions, so let's see how many we can get through over the next half an hour or so. So this is a question from <coughs> TJ, and TJ is one of my clients. This is basically a bit of a conversation that we had on one of our check-ins, and he thinks it'll be useful for people to know. So he said, I think a discussion of filling non-protein sources would be useful, like carbs versus fats. So just to give you a background on this, I think protein is very useful filling uh, macro. But then after we've fulfilled protein needs, we have to kind of figure out, well, where else are we going to allocate the rest of our calories to? Carbs, fats, what are the preferences? And if we just get this out of the way first, we are primarily interested in non-processed whole foods. We get that. So we've assessed protein requirements, we've met those. We're getting our calories from whole foods beyond that. Okay, let's look at carbs versus fats. And normally beyond that, people, um, rightfully so, say, don't worry about it. Just eat well, eat to preference. And I think that's useful. So guys like um, Lade Norton will typically, and I, I don't think I'm misphrasing him, but I think he'll typically say, you know, equate protein, equate calories, eat whole foods, and you're good to go, which is very sensible advice. I guess I just want to discuss a little bit more nuance if people are interested. So that's kind of where the discussion's at. A lot of people, this might not apply, but you know, some of you might find it interesting. So anyway, carbs versus fats, where do we allocate the rest of our calories? Now, my personal preference is carbs. I think carbs give you a lot. And I think they've been kind of demonized recently. You can go through, uh, you can really get down the rabbit hole of the anti-carb um, crew on the internet. There's a whole wide network of guys who are very, very pro-fat. They're usually the sort of pro-meat, pro-fat kind of guys. And as a result, they tend to downplay the role of carbs. But I think they provide a great deal of value. So loads of performance benefits, I think huge performance benefits to be full and fully glycinated going to the gym. There's a lot of benefit there. A lot of athletic benefits, a lot of anabolic benefits. And I think in general, um, if it were between carbs and fats, I think I would preference fat, uh, carbs. There is this argument that people constantly make, which is that carbs aren't essential. But then, I mean, we don't need that much fat to, for a, to fulfill our essential requirements there either. We don't need that much protein. <laughs> so I think it's a bit of a weird argument. Like, yes, yeah, sure, carbs aren't essential, but we're not really talking about that. We're talking about specific levels, like what could be useful. So for performance. Um, and the same guy who says carbs aren't essential is eating 100 grams of fat. Like, is that essential? I don't think so. So we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the best amounts? It's not a zero-sum game. It's not either black or white, like nothing or or all of it. So let's just try and figure out what's, what's best for us. Now, I think once we've satisfied protein requirements, once we've satisfied essential fat requirements, which are pretty low, I think then if it's a choice of where to fill in the rest of your calories, as long as you're taking care of satiety, so you're handling enough um, calories, allocating them to, say, whole proteins if you need more satiety or vegetables or fruits, then you can start to allocate extras into carbs. And if you're a reasonably built guy or girl with a reasonable activity level, you should have some carbs, you should have some calories left over. And I happen to prefer funneling them into carbs. I think they give you more energy. And my, my diet approach that I preach to my clients is filled in with additional, a focus on additional carbs. So yeah, I, I think I didn't think carbs. And in terms of carb sources, it really depends on the whole appetite thing. Now, leaning more towards the leaner side of things, I'm looking at legumes, beans, lentils, potatoes, stuff like that. Leaning more towards the guys who struggle to get the food in, you're looking at your typical bodybuilder foods like rice, rice, pasta, stuff like that, um, yams, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how I break it up. Fulfill the um, essential requirements, get in your essential protein, get in your essential fats, then ensure you're filling in, topping up with um, more satiating options if you need to. So if you have if you have trouble keeping your weight down, then fill in with more protein, fill in with more fruits and vegetables. My recommendation for fruits and vegetables is up to 800 grams because of a study that I saw a couple of years ago, which was a meta review of um, health and basically 800 grams is a good cutoff. Then after that, that's what this section is about. Where do you get your calories from? Then I would say funnel them into carbs and pick those types of carb sources. At the very extreme ends, so where I've got guys bulking on four, four and a half thousand calories, 5,000 calories and more than that, that's when we would be a little bit looser. 
with carb and extra calorie choices. That's when I would decide to funnel more carbs, more sorry, more calories into fats. I find with my really big guys, and I've got a few on the books at the moment who are 100, 110, 120 kilos, so anywhere between 220 to 40 pounds and more, I find with those guys, even having them up to about 600 grams of carbs per day, there's an issue with gaining weight and also keeping them full. I've got one guy in the books at the moment, um, he's bulking on about 4,000 calories. Just packing him full of a lot of carbs without the appropriate fat intake, it just, he gets, he goes through them way too quickly. So he's not gaining, he, he doesn't gain weight. So you kind of have to bump his fats up and they help the weight stick to him a little bit. So it's a very unscientific way of looking at things, but that's just what I've seen. If I fill him full of carbs with very low fat, his blood glucose just drops between meals and he gets, he, he just, he just gets really flat. So you kind of have to bump in a bit of fat intake. Now, I, this is similar to a question we had yesterday. To, I, I can't always provide you with the, the science on this in a short segment like this, but I'm just hopefully providing you with some useful information. So hopefully that was a, pr a pretty good setup in terms of where to funnel your calories. Okay, so next question is we are looking at, okay, right, we've got here, okay, Paul Velasquez. This is a question about electrolyte supplementation. Paul's asked a few questions and I've hesitated to give him an answer yet because I think you have to be very careful when you're talking about electrolytes. And I gave a lot of disclaimers in that video about electrolytes where I talked about potassium and sodium and magnesium and calcium because it can be quite a dangerous subject, electrolytes. You know, like for example, if you overdose on potassium, like you die, <laughs> it's, you know, it's serious stuff. So, or you can burn a hole through your stomach. You know, there is a reason why potassium supplements only come in very, very small amounts because the government can't trust people to do things right, and rightfully so, but this stuff's dangerous. But So I'll start, I'll lead off with that pr disclaimer again. And normally I only really discuss this stuff in detail with my clients so that I have videos where I'm explaining this stuff. There's a lot of explanation in that vitamin and mineral video. There's plenty in there, and I give my minimum amounts and all that kind of stuff. Now, Paul's asked about, he's bought a supplement, and it only really supplies a small amount. They usually come in 99 milligrams, and it's simply because people will take them, and if they take too many, they'll burn a hole in their stomach. It's not good. In general, what I do, okay, again, with the whole disclaimer and everything, I get potassium powder, the potassium citrate powder, and I just sprinkle a little bit onto either my food or I will have it in a juice drink, like dilute juice, and just drink that. I personally find that's okay, but it's, an air, it's something where you have to start down this road very, very lightly. So when I gave you those stretch targets for six grams of potassium, four sodium, one and a half calcium, one magnesium, they are designed to be built into slowly. Okay, Don't immediately try to get those, get a stomachache and then think, oh, what have I done? Be careful. Okay, the, You're not playing around with um, just adding in some extra potatoes. Like This is serious stuff you're playing with, so be careful with your health. Um, but yeah, that's why the government has seen that it's, People just can't be trusted to do this correctly. So they've really cut down because you can really get yourself in trouble. Either burn a hole through your stomach, upset your electrolyte balance, and do funny things with your heart. A lot of bad stuff could happen. So be careful. Get into those amounts carefully over time, a little bit at a time, and assess. Take it seriously. So that's that's what I do. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll go to the next question here. Um, Barry says, is it possible to gain two to three centimeters of arm circumference in a year's time. Now, I think two to three centimeters of arm circumference is about an inch, I think. Two, it's for three, three centimeters and in inches is, yeah, it's about an inch, just over an inch. Um, yeah, I mean, of course it is. Of course you can. You can <laughs> but it depends how much of it you want to be lean muscle, right? So if you want to gain... They, they used to say, if you want to gain an inch on your arms, it's about 10 pounds of lean muscle, which I think is about right. Because if you think a natural trainee who gains a lot of mass is probably going to gain something in the region of 30-ish pounds over the span of a lifetime, on average. Like, I don't believe there's a limit, but you know, on average, that's what a good natty trainer would gain. And that would equate to about three inches, sure. Maybe up to 16-inch guns from 13. It's about right. So yeah, 10 pounds of lean mass. So you're asking about gaining 10 pounds of actual lean tissue. 
And to prove that, you would have to gain up in weight, diet down to the same body fat. Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? No. Now, the best that I've done with the client was I had him gain about 15 pounds of lean mass. And this was this was not a beginner. As a beginner, you probably can actually. The first year, you should be gaining 10, 20 pounds. But um, if you're speaking about a guy who already trains, one guy that I trained, a guy called Mark, a uh, good few years ago now, he had held his weight back for many years due to playing sports. And so we actually gained 15 pounds of lean mass in about 18 months of working together. And I really force fed him up and we, we shredded back down. We actually ended up doing a bodybuilding show together. But that was an extremely extraordinary circumstance. For a beginner, yes. For anything else, an intermediate, highly unusual. And when I put on about, I think it was 12 pounds for Mark in about 18 months, um, that was a tremendous gain. He, he looked like a completely different person. So take from that what you will. It's a lot of muscle. Um, but you know, I think what you should all, you should always be trying. I'm not sure I find a lot of value in those questions, Barry, because um, not <laughs> wrong way to word that. What, what I mean is I, I don't find a lot of value in looking at things in that way. I find more of a value of thinking, okay, how can I plan my gaining phases, my cutting phases with myself, with my clients? What am I looking for on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis? And let's execute that. And that's the way I've always thought. Like, um, I remember when I was younger and I, I read in these books that I used to read that gaining five pounds on a lift was great per month. <laughs> and um, I remember thinking to myself, ah, that's amazing. That means I can gain 50 pounds in a year. I, that, that was my thought process. Like, and nowadays, if people hear five pounds in a month, they think, oh, crap, that's rubbish. But I don't know. It's just my thought process. I'm like, well, I'm not doing anything else in a year's time. I'll still be here. I'll still be lifting. So... 50 pounds is fantastic. And oftentimes, that's probably more than you're going to gain as well. I mean, imagine if you gained, you know, 25 pounds on whatever your bench is right now, because you look like you work out from your, from what I can tell from your avatar. That's two and a half pounds a month. People would scoff at that. Nobody would just limit themselves to two and a half pounds per month. But if you're doing that consistently, then over a year, you've got 25 pounds on a bench. And assuming you've got a half decent bench, that's pretty good, you know? So, yeah, I, I think there's more value to be said in, okay, what can I accomplish on any given year of time for muscle gain or maybe month, uh, breaking it down into month for strength gain. Just look a bit, just think a bit more short, uh, long term. All right. So now we've got next question from Danny. Danny says, do you think women should train any differently than men? He goes on to explain about his fiance uh, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Firstly, congratulations on the engagement. Um, hopefully, you're, uh, you're you're getting married soon and not not keeping it going for too long. Now, the, as to the question of how people should train, okay, for the most part, you should train in whatever way you in you should train for whatever priority you have. Okay, for the most part. Now, that's a very broad answer because. In certain situations, like a ranked beginner or an early intermediate, those ways that you should think about training are pretty much defined for you. As a beginner, as in my uh, beginner book, The Noob, um, if I remember, I'll link it. But if not, just go to this link down below. Uh, go to my website, The Noob book. That details a routine which focuses on muscle growth, obviously, but it also focuses on teaching you the right movement patterns, which will benefit you in the intermediate stage. So you should always train what is your focus. However, during certain points of your training life, your focus should be on, on different things. So in the beginning, your focus should be on perfecting movement patterns. What that means is, as a beginner, I would rather have you doing some type of squatting movement rather than focusing on leg extensions or, or, or stuff like that, because you need to know how to move. Like, yes, squats aren't mandatory. I get that. But there's a bit more nuance to that answer. It's not a, it's, again, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not either we do them or we don't. Being able to squat, at least practicing the squatting movement, will set you up a lot better for gains down the road while still building your leg muscles. So there is appropriateness. Now, when it comes to training females, assuming, I think you said she was a beginner, actually. Yeah, I mean, if she is a beginner in a week, I would put her on my new program. Just get that, 15 quid get it, put her on that. I, I take her through the entire first year. 
And that's how I train my beginners. I don't train my female beginners any differently because they don't need that at that stage. When they're intermediates to advanced and they actually have some whole body muscle, then they can specialize on the lower body a little bit more if that's what they choose. Most of my females on the books, they want to specialize on legs and occasionally back and shoulders. I've not had many women who want to specialize on like chest and arms. I have had some and that's fine, but they're normally the exception rather than a rule. Nothing wrong with that. It's fine. I mean, most guys want to specialize on shoulders and arms. It's perfectly normal. So um, yeah, it's just one of those. But for your question, Danny, and just as a broad sort of guidance for everyone, you should always aim to train for whatever you want to build up the most, right? So if you have a preference for a certain area, train with that area in mind. However, at certain points, there are defined benefits to training certain things. Like when you're a beginner, ensure you are learning all the right movement patterns, which is detailed in my ebook. When you're an early stage intermediate, you probably don't need to specialize. In fact, you're probably losing out on overall gains if you specialize that early on. Late intermediate to advanced, specialization is almost mandatory. So yeah, hopefully that, that makes sense. Gives you enough of a broad answer, but also some nuance as well. All right. Um, okay, so here was a question from Ayan. Ayan says, does it make sense to do the 853 on the squat bench deadlift in the Barbarian? No, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. However, Ayan, you did mention um, the whole thing to do with weight gain and, and whatnot. So firstly, I don't. I think the rep scheme, as I've mentioned before, uh, as, just as a broad answer, there's nothing magical about rep schemes. They are simply designed to keep you progressing, keep you forward thinking, and slowly inching in the gains. So I don't mind if you use those for any of my programs, it's fine. The second part, which is again applicable to everyone, is if you are stalled out, it's likely not your programming. Because I know we, we hammer on a lot about programming in this, in this industry, in this fitness industry, and rightfully so. But it's more than likely your overall yearly plan. And I, I was talking about this with a prospective client on Instagram in the, in the DMs. And he was talking about how he's hit a wall. And I was talking about body weight manipulations, body weight manipulations. And he said, what do you mean manipulation? Do you mean just gaining weight? I was like, well, no. I mean strategically having diet bulking phases so you potentiate more mass. There's a difference, right? You can rebound out of cuts with more muscle. There's a difference. I'm a big believer in the P-ratio. I'm a big believer in the time-proven methods of cutting someone down so that they can build up more muscular. Like It works, you know? having a lot of those fluctuations up and down in body weight works. Something that I did during my training career was I pretty much had 90 kilos as a baseline. I would build up and past 90, then diet down to 82, 83-ish, build up and past it again. And every time I went close to 90, I was bigger and leaner. So there's a lot to be said for continuously, continuously adjusting weight up and down and fluctuating. Those waves will net you lean mass. So uh, I just want to say to everyone, if you if you are if you are starting to stagnate on your program and you listen to guys like me, Steve Shaw, um, Jeffrey Verity Schofield, um, Bald Omni Man, um, Alpha Destiny, and you know the guys I like, or all, all, the, all the good guys, right? It's probably not your programming that's the problem. It's probably some other factor. Uh, and it may be diet related. It may be how hard you're working. It may be stress. It may be sleep. But it's probably an, um, something that's less easily tangible. So I would just poke you on that again, Ayan. All right, let's see. We don't have too many more left. Um, Sam just says thanks. So thank you very much, Sam. And I think we have just a couple more. Oh, yeah, okay. Right, Helena Handbasket says, there seems to be some mixed reports of how or even when to directly target the abs. It's a good question. It's a very good question. I have changed my opinion on that over the years. And then I've realized why I was right before and now I'm right now and I've realized why. So when I was when I was younger and I was piloting, I never did ab work really. I said, well, that's not that's not true. I, I did it for short, short, short spells, okay? And I, I, I didn't really believe in ab work that much. So if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said no. Now, as I then got more into bodybuilding, I started to do more ab work. So I kind of went back. I thought, no, I was wrong before. 
now I realize I was right in both times of my like career. <laughs> what a happy ending. <laughs> but it's because when you guys can guess, right, what, what was I doing when I was doing a lot of powerlifting? You know my background. You know I, I, I have very high frequency specific approach, right? So I was doing a lot of squats and deadlifts for relatively high volume every week, um, pretty much every session. That does a ton of, it gives you a ton of ab strengthening. Now, when I was a bodybuilder, I do a lot less of that kind of stuff. I do a lot more machine work, a lot more dumbbells, a lot more isolation. On any given week, I'm probably doing squats and deadlifts about once, whereas previously, and that's for, for lower volumes. Previously, I was doing squat, bench, and deadlift every day. Um, so, you know, it's a case of your abs do get secondary work from squats and deadlifts. If you're a bodybuilder, I would probably do some ab work, you know, because you're just not going to be doing that much squatting and deadlifting. So I would, I would, I would for sure. Okay, right. Gravity training um, says, um, okay, he wants a video on dynamic double progression. Some hints and tips. It's his primary form of progression. I think it's really good. I think it's really good. Um, I've not heard anyone discuss dynamic double progression for a while, and there have been various incantations of dynamic double progression over the years. So let me just explain what it is. Okay, so in a typical set and rep scheme, so usual, you know, regular double progression, you'll have something like three sets of eight to 12, okay? And you start off, say, 100 kilos, and you get, I don't know, 12, eight, eight, okay? The next session, you aim to do 12 and, and a bit more on the subsequent set. So you might get 11 and then 10. And eventually, when you get 12, 12, 12, you add some weight and you carry on. That's double progression. Everyone knows what that is, okay? Now, dynamic double progression is where each individual set is kind of like its own entity. And so you can add weight to the first set, but you don't necessarily have to add weight to the next set. You can add reps to one set. You can add reps to the next set, but they're on different, slightly different poundages. So you have a block of reps, but you don't always have to go up in weight all at the same time. So whereas in the first example, the, the typical double progression, you would just stick to that weight to be 100 kilos, 12, 12, 12. In this example, you might think, okay, this week I'm going to take my first set, I'm going to go up to 105 kilos, and then I'm going to drop the weight and do 100, 100. I'm going to slowly going to build it up. So the, the sets and reps, they're more dynamic across that little block of sets and reps that you're doing. Yeah, I think it's fine. It gives you one more avenue for progress, which is important. And it's something that I said in the other, one of the other Q&As, that the value of all of these set and rep schemes is that they allow you for smaller, more minuscule progressions. That's the value. So in this new progression, if we go up in weight on the first set, we don't have to do that on the second and third set. It's proportionally a smaller jump. That's what's valuable about these progressions. So if you just pan out, okay, just look at things from a macro basis. My eights, fives, and threes, um, Steve's rep scheme, this dynamic double progression, they all allow you for just small mini steps of progression. That's the important thing, okay? It's you want to keep moving forward, but at the same time, you don't always want to add weight or reps because at a certain point, adding one more rep across every set that you're doing, it's a lot of work. Even adding one rep to the first set, which will cause subsequent fatigue for the next set, it's a lot of work. So it represents a large, um, it represents a lot of weight, essentially, if we were to convert it to a one rep max. Like moving your 100 kilo bench up from, I don't know, six reps to eight reps, it's a big jump. Moving it from five to six is an even bigger jump. Moving it from a single to a double is an even bigger jump. So at a certain strength stand point, it progressively, each rep, repetition jump gets progressively harder and harder. But the irony is, as you get stronger and stronger, each rep gets, it represents a greater and greater amount of progress. But also, <laughs> the stronger you are, the less progress you could make from week to week. So what do you do? That's where these things come into play. You know, if you're a guy who's got a 180 kilo bench, even going from a set of 180 for five, like 400 pound bench for five to 400 pound bench for six, that's, that's a big jump, a big jump. So these set rep schemes, they allow you to have small, minuscule jumps. That's why they're useful in progression. And progression, it progression isn't always tied to just your hard sets and reps. So this provides a little more nuance. Like I said in another video, 
Another thing that we used to do was we would just take time to own the weight. So let's go back to my 100 kilos for three sets of 12 example. Okay, let's say you get to 100 kilos for three sets of 12. Do we go up to 105 on the first set, like this dynamic dual progression, like gravity training might do? Or do we take a couple of weeks just to own the weight? And what I mean by owning the weight, I'll just reiterate what I said in the last video, is you make the reps look better. You allow yourself to spend a couple of weeks progressing in an intangible way by just making the reps look cleaner. Again, very small jumps. So you might have slightly shorter rest periods between sets. You might have better pauses. You might have more control. It might just feel easier. That's a form of progression. Yeah. So look at look at these set and rep schemes in that way. All of them. It doesn't matter what you do. And I know I'm not being a very good salesman for my approach because my 853 is, you know, it I, I say the same thing about those. There's nothing special about them. It just allows for small incremental gain. So uh, if I was uh, if I was a better salesman, I might say that this magical set and rep scheme, something magical about the eights, fives, and threes. But the reality is there isn't. There's nothing special about these set and rep schemes at all. None of them. But you get to that sort of Zen level where you understand. You can look at these things from a macro basis, look down upon them, and look at all these set and rep schemes are the same. They just allow for small, minuscule improvements. So it makes the lifter feel good. And in the same way, as I say, for you, gravity training, you could take your your uh, your set and reps for say I don't know whatever you're doing for the high bar I think high bar squat is your your latest um, sort of uh, push and let's say you work up to point I, I can't remember what you what you're lifting but let's say you do four plates for I don't know three sets of five okay you could spend a month or two just making those three sets of five look and feel easy so slightly more explosive every time good solid pauses maybe shorter rest periods between sets almost intangible improvements which are still making the set and rep block more taxing so it's still progress but it might be almost impossible to add like one or two reps but you can make those minuscule changes so at the end of the two months oh, i can go up and wait now a lot of people would do that back in the day that's how we would train so all this talk about micro loading people didn't do that back in the day people thought the micro loaders were a bit like geeky um, you know <laughs> you go from um 100 kilos to 101 kilos to 102 kilos like it was looked down upon like and it, it, unfairly so i'm not saying micro loading is, is rubbish it's not like it's a good tactic but it's people just had a different strategy back then they would just clean up the reps make them look good own the weight that's what it was called and then once you owned 100 for three sets of 12 you would go up to 110 own that for a few months go up to 120 own that for a few months Do you see what i mean that's how it worked so I, I don't know if you could say it's a less complicated system. In a way, it's a more complicated system, but that's just it's just different ways. But just my point is, just look at set to rep, look at set and rep schemes in that way. They are just designed to allow for small incremental progression. So no real tips there, you know, all good. Right, uh, one N Kane says, any recommendations for trustworthy magnesium potassium supplements? Um, just look online, uh, Amazon. That's what I do. Amazon it. Um, yeah, magnesium. Uh, citrate, I think, online uh, and my Amazon um, potassium citrate as well. I think, um, yeah, I just get powders and mix them together. I get powders, I mix them together, and then I just put them into a little drink like this, and it tops up my amounts, um, as I showed you in that video. Yeah, so no, nothing special. Just just go to Amazon. Amazon tend to vet their supplements quite well. Right, I think we are almost at the end. It's okay, so. Richard says, uh, Richard's a really nice guy, so it was very complimentary. Although, Richard, I have to apologize, I can't answer this question. Um, he says, what do you think of the GZCL method? I don't know anything about it. By the time that came out, I had kind of lost interest in other people's programs. I was busy doing and perfecting my own. So I, I was conscious of 531 and um, strong lifts and all that kind of crap that came out. Um, but after that, I, I don't know. I, I just didn't pay attention. I was, I was busy doing my own thing. In the UK, we had a very thriving sort of scene where people were discussing ideas. We were, we were doing. I think the general trend at the time was to do more high frequency training, which is what I did. So, I just didn't. So sorry, Richard. I can't answer that one. Uh, and I, I don't want to try and pretend I know because I don't. And the final question from Baki is, why do many coaches themselves train under another coach? It's a good question. Right, so here's going to be another one of those um, answers, which is, uh, 
maybe, I don't know, downplaying my own services a little bit. But <clears throat> so let's just firstly just just say you get you get a range of good coaches and you get a range of coaches who just aren't so good. And I think the difference is intention. Okay. So somebody who intends to learn and get better is always going to come out as a better coach. Always. They might not get everything right the first time. They might not get everything right all the time. But as long as they're willing to learn and pick things up, they will get better over time. This is what I see. The ones that I see around here, my local city where I live, who have very, very closed minds, they drop off. Like I've been, I've been doing this for a while now. I've actual, not YouTube, but actual coaching. Back here, I've seen a ton of guys come and go. I've seen a ton of guys like steal my material and then come and go because they don't have any intention of getting better, of learning for life. So they just go. So I think that group of coaches, we can just put them to one side. Okay, No one hires those. We don't care what they do. In the realm of coaches who are progressive and perfect their own techniques, work with their clients to create new routines and see trends and enhance their own learning, out of those, apart from different ways of progressing, there's not that much difference to the outcome. If you go on to say, I don't know, um, Steve Shaw's coaching, you're going to progress. I'm, I'm sure you are. I've never been coached by Steve, but he's a good coach. He knows what he's doing. He gets results. In the same way, he has a different. He has some different systems to me. I have some different systems to him. In the same way, we have different systems to um, Alpha Destiny. So if he was to coach you, there'd be different ways of doing things, but you would get results within the ecosystem of their training. Now, so it's not a question of knowledge. It's a question of the other things. Occasionally, occasionally a coach will teach you new stuff, and that's cool, right? And some approaches you might jive with better. Like you might jive with an approach which is maybe slightly away from training to failure, just a lot more volume. It's cool. You might jive with a particular coach who emphasizes that more. You might jive mentally more with training to failure and lower volume routines. Cool. So you'd naturally gravitate towards coaches like that. But in terms of what the coach can give you, it's not just the knowledge. It can also be the intangible factors like the accountability. Now, I think particularly when it comes to hard training and hard dieting, that can be invaluable. Oftentimes, you'll see people hire a coach for a contest prep or if they're in a particularly hard phase of training, going to a competition meet or whatever they're doing. Or even just dieting, like keeping their head on right when they're dieting. And not, not dieting for contest prep or, or fat loss, but for gaining weight. Accountability and sticking to the plan is huge. Oftentimes, assuming we're talking about good coaches, they might not teach you anything particularly new, but they can offer accountability and some, so basically somebody in your corner, excuse me, somebody in your corner who is interested in what you're doing and you can bounce ideas off them. And I think that's invaluable. So yeah, I mean, I've had quite a few coaches over the last 20 years. I wouldn't say many of them have taught me anything particularly new. Um, it's not been that different. I mean, I think one of the reasons why things like vlogs are so useful is because you get to see what your favorite guy is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, like what they're eating, how they're food prepping and all that kind of thing. That kind of stuff is practical, it's useful. But a lot of that you can get from the internet these days as well. Training routines, you can get them from the internet. I think it's more the intangibles. It's more the support, the accountability, the focus, and also the fact that you're monetarily involved in this. So you're paying money to this guy. As a result, you're training, you're going to put in that much more effort. There's also that too. So I don't want to downplay sort of my services or anyone else's, but I think if you have a coach who has a who has a basically a standard number of ways of working, you're going to get results. And whether you're going with coach A, coach B, or coach C is mostly a matter of personal preference. But then above and beyond that, so it's, what I'm saying is it's not the knowledge they're giving you necessarily. So a coach who has his own method and knows what he's doing, he's necessarily getting knowledge from other coaches, just like you might not necessarily. I mean, for a, for a trainee who's completely green, they would. But a lot of times, those coaches, they are getting more of the intangibles. It's the accountability. It's the... It's having that someone in your corner. Like I know for me, I have a few, I'm, I'm blessed enough to have a few people that I can talk to training with. I can talk about my own training because I still get excited about my training. You know, I still want to talk about it. I still want to, I still want to 
think I, I want to bounce around some ideas. You know, I'm still excited about training. It's nice to have people to talk to. Now, if I was to do a contest prep, I might hire a coach. Uh, if I was to ever compete in a bodybuilding show again, I might hire a coach so that I would have someone in my corner every week that I could bounce ideas off, but also somebody who could keep me accountable and say, okay, we're going to stick to this plan. It's going well to objectively look at what I'm doing. So that was quite a long discussion into that, but I guess I wanted to point out that they're not necessarily getting knowledge from the coaches because they have the knowledge, but they're getting an objective view at what they're doing. And that's quite useful. When you're in it yourself, you're not always, well, by definition, you're not objective. You can't always see things objectively. So it, it can be useful to have somebody for, on the outside who's looking in at what you're doing. And as long as you're providing them with the data, they can give you an eye on what you should be doing and what you shouldn't and whether you should make changes, whether you should keep going. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, I, don't, I don't personally feel that if a coach hires another coach, it's a bad thing. I think if anything, it's a good thing in the sense that they're taking their sport seriously, but also they acknowledge the value of a coach. So I think that's important. All right, guys, I think that's the last question. Just going through my messages. I've realized that it doesn't look great when I'm looking down because it looks like I'm not paying attention, but I'm, I promise I'm just looking at my phone. <laughs> so I think that's about it. But um, you guys are awesome as always, and I will see you in uh, the next one, April. So. All the best, folks. Take care.